Okay, thank you. Um, it's really nice to be here. I'm Sjoerd Huisman. I'm a PhD student in the Netherlands. Uh, and I'm working with Boudewijn, who gave not the previous talk, but the talk before. But I see that some people are walking out and in, so I will tell some things that Boudewijn has told as well, but um, I think I'll have to repeat them. Um, so I will tell you about BrainScope, which is um, a portal for interactive visual exploration of the spatial and temporal, temporal human brain transcriptome. In other words, we're looking at viewing gene expression in the brain. So we want to visualize this. And we're not, we're not visualizing our own data, so we're visualizing data from the Allen, Allen Brain Atlas. And Biden already gave an introduction into the Allen Brain Institute. Um, but just briefly, it's an institute in, uh, in the US where they uh, collect a lot of data, and they collect this data just to get it out there for everyone, and it's all publicly available. But I will be talking about one specific data set they have, and that's the uh, Brain Atlas for the adult healthy adult human, so it's a healthy brain. So what they did is they collected six brains, six donor brains, and these were carefully checked not to have to be very healthy before they died, obviously. Um, I've been pointing out that a few times that it was a healthy brain and people said they're dead. Um, but okay. Uh, but at least they didn't have any like, neurodegenerative diseases and stuff like that before they died, and they didn't have any alcohol in their blood, and there was quite careful checking there. Um, so what they did for each brain is they took a brain, they sliced it up, and then in the slice, this, so this is a view of the slice of a, of a section like that through the brain, coronal section, and then it took samples out of that. And for the bigger parts, they took it out with a, a knife and the smaller parts with the laser. And then they took in total 3,700 samples of these six brains. Now the sampling is not the same for each of the brains. So in one brain there are 300 samples, another one there are 900 samples. But there are one in a five regions that are sampled at least once in each of these six brains. And in the rest of the presentation, I will be working with these one in a five regions instead of all the 3,700. Okay. So we basically took the mean over the six brains. So what they did is they used a microarray um, to measure genome-wide expression for each of these samples for each of these regions in the brain. Okay. So this is what you get in the end. This is a heat map, probably familiar to most of you. Um, in the rows, you see the genes, and in the columns, you see here the samples, or actually the one in five brain regions. And in colors, you see the uh, z-scores of the expression. So if something is red here, that means this gene has a higher than average expression in this part of the brain. So this is a very nice resource. And by the way, I talked about it a bit as well. Um, there's a lot you can get from this. But it's also very complex because we have samples that have a location in the brain. And we have these 20,000 genes that have, can have multiple functions in different parts of the brain. So it's a very complex data set. And we've been working with it for a while and, uh, in a study, where, for instance, where we looked at migraine and tried to find out which uh, parts of the brain were involved in migraine. But something we really missed is to get a visual overview of the data, to view the whole data set and actually see something, right? Because if you go to the Adam Brain Institute's website, it's a great website, but you, you basically get this view first, right? So you get this heat map. And you can see some things in it, but you can't really see all the genes, for instance, because this thing has 20,000 rows and the screen doesn't have that many pixels in the vertical direction. Um, so you can't really see all the genes. And Something else you're really missing here is the spatial uh, information, right? You can't see where the samples were taken from. You can't see where the genes were expressed in the brain spatially. So if you look at another type of visualization of this data, you could look at a slice like this, right? So this is, again, a coronal slice through the brain. Again, in red, it's high expression. In blue, it's low expression. But this is just one gene, right? And we have 20,000 genes, so if you want to do this genome-wide, then you have to look at 20,000 of these pictures. So we want you to have something else. So what would we like to see in a visualization? Sorry, sorry. Well, we want to see the spatial activity of each gene, like we just saw in the slice. But you also might want to see groups of similar genes, right? Like co-expression clusters, you could think of. And perhaps even their functions. 
I could also ask for each brain sample if you're interested in a specific brain region rather than a specific gene. You could want to ask for a specific part of the brain which genes are expressed here. But then, of course, you also want to know where this is. And you could think of uh, trying to see what the similarities between brain areas are just based on gene expression. So those are a few things you would want to see in a visualization. So Bardewein already gave an introduction into T's and E, but I think there are a few new people here, so I have to give a quick intro as well. Uh, so here you see the heat, this heat map again, where in the rows we have again the genes, in the columns we have the samples or the brain regions. I use these names uh, interchangingly, which can be very confusing because samples often refers to people, right? Um, and on the right, we see a T's and E map. So this is T-distributed stochastic neighborhood embedding. And what it basically means is it's similar to a multidimensional scaling or a PCA, where you try to go for a high, from a high-dimensional space to a low-dimensional space. But what T's and E does specifically is that it tries to preserve the distances of points that are close in high-dimensional space. So if you have two points in this map, then these points are similar in the high dimensional space if they are close in the low dimensional space. In this case, every point is a sample, which is taken from a specific part of the brain. And if two samples are close together, this means these two samples are similar across the gene expressions. Okay. So something you can also see here is that I have these axes, dimension one, dimension two. But in a PCA, these dimensions actually mean something, right? You can go back to the original uh, space by looking at the loadings for these dimensions. But in a T's and E, they don't mean anything. Like Bardewein said, it's a random process. And if you repeat it, you, could, you would get something very similar, but it might be flipped and rotated. Uh, and the scale also doesn't really have a meaning. So I will leave away these axes in the following maps. Right. So this is, again, the same map of all these samples from the brain. But you can also see that these points have colors, right? And these colors come from the Allen Reference Atlas. So the Allen Atlas has made its own atlas of the brain. And you can see, for instance, at the bottom, um, I don't know if the front work, yeah. So you can see, for instance, at the bottom uh, here, these pinkish and yellowish points, they're all from the cortex of the brain. And you see the bright blue on the right, which is all from the cerebellum. And, but also the smaller parts, so we have this striatum and um, we have the hippocampus, and all these regions, they, are, they cluster together very strongly. So if you, if you just look at gene expression without considering the location, you can actually make a, make a pretty nice reconstruction of where uh, parts of the brain belong. But you can also see differences between the anatomical distance and the distance in expression space, because on the right, like I said, we have this cyan blob of cerebellum samples, but there are also some cerebellum samples up here. And those are actually much closer in their gene expression to the brainstem. So it turns out these are actually the cerebral, uh, cerebellar cortex samples, and the other ones are the cerebellar nuclei samples. So there's actually, there's actually a lot of information in this map. Okay. So what we can also do now is to use the same, to look at the same data set, but flip it. Right? And then we can look at the similarities between genes. So now we have a map where each point is a gene, not a, not a sample from the brain. And if two points here are close together, that means there are two genes that are similar in their expression pattern spatially across the brain. Okay. Now this looks a bit like a, just a big blob, right? It's difficult to see anything in this map of the genes. So something we did is we made a density map of it. And if there's a high density, this means there's a group of genes here that's very similar, right? They are strongly att attracted to each other. So they're very similar. So we look at the high densities in this map, and then just, just for an illustration purposes, we select the top 3,000 genes in the highest densities. And if you then look at these groups of genes you end up with, you can look at their functions, right? And you can look at where they are expressed in the brain. So let's, for instance, take this group of genes. So this is mainly expressed in the white matter, as you can see in these three slices of the brain, of the half brain. Um, and if you look at the functions, of these genes, and we do a go enrichment analysis, then you can see that uh, a lot of these genes are involved in enchantment of neurons, which makes sense for genes that are expressed in the white matter. Right? If you look at another blob a bit more to, down to the left, then you can see find a group of genes that's uh, strongly involved in the immune response. Or if you go to the top, then you find a group of genes that's more expressed in the cortex, and 
There are a lot of genes in here that are involved in forebrain development. We can find all kinds of stuff in here. So, but what you, what you can see in general is that you, if you look at, these, uh, at this map and you look at groups of genes, then you often find that these have a, a very similar function, very similar functions that are usually related to the brain, which is nice. Okay. So we did this for this whole map, and then you see all these different things, which you can't really view from the room now, but if you go to the website or to the paper, you can look at all of this. So this is the BrainScope website, and I will actually try to give a live demo as well, since it worked for the previous speakers. <laughs> okay. So this is the um, BrainScope website. You can go to brainscope.nl and just give it a try yourself. Please wait until after the presentations. <laughs> and on the left here, we see the gene map. And on the right, we see the sample map. So these are the same maps as I just showed you in my presentation. And on the right, we have slices of the brain. So these are three sl slices just selected to be sort of evenly spaced throughout the brain. But of course, your region of interest might not be in it. So you can scroll down here and you can select whichever slice of the brain you would like to see. Okay. So one nice thing about this, which we couldn't see in my presentation, is that this thing is interactive. Right? So if I now mouse over a sample, then I see several things. So one thing is on the right, in these slices, you see uh, this sample light up. So this, the thing I just selected was a part of the cortex. But something else you see is that on the gene map, you see genes light up. Some genes become red, some genes become blue, and the genes that are red now are genes that are, have a high expression in this part of the brain. So if I now go to another sample here, so this, this is another pattern of gene expression. If you go to the cerebellum, we see this pattern of gene expression. So you can explore the whole space of samples and see which genes are expressed in these regions, which also helps you a lot to make more sense of this big blob of a gene map. Right? And if you want, of course, you can also click here in this map and you can get the same information. So if you prefer to click here, that can also work. Now we can also do something interesting on the other side. We can mouse over on this map. And now what we see is the expression of a set of genes centered around my cursor, the average expression. And you can see it on the sample map in the slices of the points, and you can see it on the slices of the brain, again, in color. So this, these genes I'm selecting now, they have a high expression in the cortex. Okay. Now, a final thing I would like to show in the tool is that you can select, well, we have lots of options here as well. Okay. Let's select like this. We can select a set of uh, samples here. So this are, uh, these are hypothalamus samples. And then we see in the map on the left, in the gene map, that there are, um, there's a, a group of genes that is highly expressed in, this, in the hypothalamus. Now we can also try to select those. So go to the other map. So this group here, this shows to be have a high expression in the hypothalamus, which you can also see now here, right? And then we can go to our selections here on the left. We can right click, now we have a set of genes. We can export them, we can uh, edit our selection, but we also can do gene set enrichment analysis directly from the BrainScope portal. So I don't know if the internet connection will work here, but uh, it seems to work. So I can go directly to top gene and analyze this set of genes and see what comes out. Well, perhaps nothing will come out. Ah, so at the top, you'll see hormone activity which is not a surprising thing to find for genes that have a high expression in the hypothalamus. Right? So this, I think, is a very powerful thing about this brain scope, is that you can go back and forth between the gene map and the sample map, and that way explore this whole brain and Allen, uh, this whole Allen brain atlas. So that was the demo part. See where I left my pointer? Yes. Okay, so the features we've seen in the brain scope, one is we have a transcriptome-wide gene map where we have all the genes, and we have a brain-wide sample map where we have all these different parts of the brain that are incorporated in the Allen brain atlas. Then we have the slices, these choroplasts, which give you a spatial indication of where genes are expressed or where these samples were taken from. And then we also have something I didn't show yet, is an ontology tree 
like a tree of the atlas where you can like, see the hierarchical structure of the atlas. You can select samples in that as well. Well, there's gene selection not just with clicking, but you can also upload your identifiers or just paste them in a the field. You can do Andre identifiers or gene symbols. We also have some preloaded gene sets in it. There are cell type markers, for instance, that are preloaded in it. You can just click on it and have a look at it. There's linked functional enrichment analysis, like I showed you. And there are some tutorial vis uh, videos narrated in a nice Scottish accent. Uh, so <laughs> go to the website. Or is or Irish, sorry. <laughs> so bad at this. Sorry for that. Um, it's an Irish accent. And <laughs> excuse me to all the Irish and Scottish people around here. Um, so go, go to the website and uh, have a look and listen. And we also have something else, which is another part of the portal. You can just click on it. And then you can go to uh, an adult donor comparison. Because, like I said, we have six donors, of course, in the Allen Brain Atlas. And you might wonder whether these groups of genes uh, show this pattern in each of the six brains or whether it's something that's just not very stable and just a coincidence, right? And then we also have the developmental human gene expression. So one of the other atlases they have in the, uh, from the Allen Institute is slightly lower in spatial resolution, but it has a temporal resolution. So there are brains taken from a human embryo to adult human. And then we can... Uh, show changes in brain and gene expression across time. So that's all other presentation I could give, um, but we don't have time for that. So go to the website, you can watch the tutorial videos and have a try for it yourself. So the paper has been published in Nucleic Acid Research. You can also look it up and of course go to the website. And I especially have to thank this definitely not Scottish but Irish guy, Belder van Loo, uh, who narrated the videos, but he also did all the programming work. Uh, so he, he made this whole website. I'm not really not a programmer. Um, so I think he did an amazing job also in making it so responsive that I can actually do it on a laptop. Uh, and of course, I'd like to thank the rest of my group um, in Delft and in Leiden and you for listening to my talk. Thank you, Stuart, for a very nice talk. I'm sure there are questions. Yeah, th this is really cool. Um, you know, there's uh, donated blood from NFL players, National Football League players with PTSD. They have studied that. Uh, I'm from the Army, so we're very interested in PTSD. So I was wondering if you have any plans or to extend that to visualize, you know, not just uh, expression, but uh, protein abundance as well. Yeah, so um, this... This whole uh, portal was built up in a very general way. So when, it, when, the, when all the programming was done, it was uh, Balder tried to keep it as general as possible. Um, so it's actually uh, quite easy to adjust it to any other type of data set. So definitely, if, if you're interested to have your data set in a visualization like this, and it would be suited for this application, then talk to us, and perhaps we can have a collaboration and try to visualize this. But definitely. Related to that one. Uh, for these brains, do you also have like functional connectivity data, like fMRI data, or, or and if there is, can you also add visualization for those data? And another quick question: like, is this platform open source or? Yes. So, so there there will be another paper just on the software side of this. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but on the network on the network part, uh, so there are some things we already tried on this. Um, so one thing is you, you could have thought, of course tried to show network relationships in a map just with lines. But for one thing I found there was that it's uh, that the annoying thing is that you will clearly see the lines between nodes that are very far apart, right? But things that are very close because they are very similar, the connections between those, those will disappear because they're very short, right? So it actually seems to emphasize the wrong thing. So we have to find a suitable way of like, visualizing network connections in a map like this. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marco from IGBMC Strasbourg, France. Uh, uh, actually, um, I liked a lot your presentation. Uh, uh, and you know, with, with the arrival of these in vitro technologies, brain organoids are actually going to fill with a lot, a lot of data. And actually, I was wondering whether we could use your approach basically to challenge the outcomes of our brain organoids uh, to do a direct comparison with the collection of the donors that, that you have. So is it possible to load data on this? Yeah, so at the moment, you, you cannot load your actual expression data. Of course, that would be 
uh, that takes a lot of work to do all the mapping, right? You have all these identifiers which you have to map, which will um, be a huge job. Um, but one thing uh, we work on now is to make an interactive version of this, uh, of basically this tool, uh, where you can remove and add samples to the to this uh, data. So you can say, I only want to do it on a part of the data, for instance. So we're definitely working to make this more interactive. At the moment, just interactive on this data set, but definitely something nice will be for the future to actually be able to add your own data in it as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So in view of the time, I think we yep. uh, stop questioning here. So I would like to ask Jan to come.